The Progress of John Arthur Crabb by Stephen Gregory Mrs. Crabb gave birth to a son one month after the death of her husband. She named the boy John Arthur, in memory of him. Mr. Crabb had been overjoyed at the news of his wife's unexpected pregnancy. A middle-aged man, disappointed for many years by his wife's failure to produce a child, he was delighted at the prospect of a son who would transform the marriage he saw as adequate and comfortable into something much more satisfactory. So it was tragic that he should die before the child was born. John Arthur was a remarkable little boy. For one thing, it was realized within eighteen months of his birth that he was severely mentally handicapped. As he grew into a strapping toddler it was obvious that his mind was defective. For such a young child he had a disconcerting, rasping, even sonorous voice, which he produced from his chest in a series of garbled speeches made up of sounds not unlike real words. In spite of his mother's sustained efforts to teach John Arthur the beginnings of a vocabulary, the boy continued to clamor in his own clanging language, as though half remembering words and phrases from some distant past. He developed a shock of unruly black hair which flopped over his brow, although it did not grow to such an extent on the crown or the back of his head. Most striking of all was his bulging forehead which protruded over his eyes, shadowing them. They retreated into his head like two dangerous eels in an underwater crevice. But Mrs. Crabbe soon discovered that her growing son, so inwardly disturbed and so incommunicative, had an unusual gift. He had the power in his hands to heal. The first manifestation of this was when he came into the house from the bushes of the garden holding the broken body of a fledgling bird. It stared from his cupped hands and beat itself against his palms. But soon it became calm, even torpid. As Mrs. Crabbe watched, John Arthur caressed the wound on the bird's breast until his fingers were smeared with its blood. Then he raised the tiny creature to his lips and kissed it on the crown of its head. Its eyes flickered suddenly, like gems struck from a rock. The bird hopped from the boy's hands onto the carpet. The only traces of any wound were the blood which stained John Arthur's hands and a tiny feather which clung to his lips. So Mrs. Crabbe realized that her son had an affinity with wild creatures. She could hardly help noticing his tendency to bring into the house all sorts of wounded animals, birds, and insects. Each time, however severely damaged the sparrow, the spider, or the shrew, it was soon whole again, and happy to stay with John Arthur in his room. The boy continued to grow sturdy. He carried himself well, if occasionally with a stoop, cultivated from the almost continual nursing of injured creatures. The mass of hair still fell on his forehead and still his eyes seemed buried under his powerful brow. John Arthur's hands were long and thin, even fragile. They held the dusty wings of a moth or the limbs of a daddy longlegs with a tenderness which Mrs. Crabbe found touching. As she watched her son's strong body and his ponderous head hunched over his latest find she marveled at the gentleness of his fine fingers. Then she felt her love for John Arthur and her regret for her dead husband mingling and aching inside her. The boy did not go to school. Instead, he stayed at home and tended his ever-growing collection of specimens. His bedroom was full of small creatures which came and went from his window. They were not imprisoned. They were free to go, once heated by the warmth of John Arthur's fingers, but sometimes the grateful creatures would return to the boy. John Arthur could not wash or dress himself. He could not feed himself without making a fearful mess. He could not communicate with other human beings although he still held forth at length, and with a seemingly increasing vocabulary, in his own discordant language. But John Arthur had the heat in his hands and the breath from his lips to salve and restore the broken limbs of his many patients. Naturally, word of John Arthur's power spread among Mrs. Crabbe's friends, the circle that had grown up as her husband had become more successful. 
They had consoled her on the death of Mr. Crabbe and had followed the development of John Arthur. But much as Mrs. Crabbe enjoyed the company of her friends, she often felt that their interest in her and her curious son was ghoulish. She imagined them discussing John Arthur with a sort of unhealthy relish whenever she was not there. She could hear them describing the inhabitants of his bedroom, the voles, the mice, and the moths, the leathery bat and the ducking, sidling jackdaw which never blinked. Mrs. Crabbe particularly resented the dashing Mrs. Sylvester, who pried into John Arthur's every small sign of progress, who chuckled at his rasping cries. She was gaudy, metallic. Mrs. Crabbe resented her almost predatory interest in the boy. Mrs. Sylvester had a son who was as pert as herself. He was a success at school, regarding his fellows with a lift of his eyebrows and a mocking smile. Sometimes he accompanied his mother on her visits to Mrs. Crabbe's house, but he was plainly uncomfortable in the presence of John Arthur. He flushed under the distant gaze of John Arthur's eyes and seemed overwhelmed, dominated by the weight of John Arthur's brow. But his mother remained jaunty, and her son gained in confidence until he, too, had developed a kind of growing curiosity about the power of John Arthur's fragile hands. Then tragedy struck the Sylvester family. Within a few hours of being bright and swift, Mrs. Sylvester's son fell gravely ill. He lay inert on his bed, his eyes open but unseeing. The doctors diagnosed that the boy had had the seed of a tumor growing within his skull, unsuspected until now. With the sudden pressure of the tumor against his brain, he was immediately paralyzed in every limb. Furthermore, the tumor, at present the size of a small fist, would continue to grow, unclenching like a fist threatening to burst within the boy's head. He would die. Meanwhile, he lay with his eyebrows raised and with his mouth fixed in the faint smile which he had so often carried in the swift brightness of his health. More doctors were consulted. All of them were pessimistic, even advising against the boy's removal from the house to a hospital. It would be in vain, better to leave him lying on his own bed, breathing faintly and with the hard smile caught on his lips. One evening Mrs. Crabb was astonished, on answering the door, to see the figure of Mrs. Sylvester standing in the porch. The powerful, still glinting woman held the motionless body of her son in her arms. She stepped silently into the house. John Arthur stood at his mother's elbow and watched the progress of the woman who came into the hall. His chin was up, his eyes caught the light and threw it back at the limp boy in Mrs. Sylvester's arms. There was an electric, crackling interchange between the sunken eyes of John Arthur and those of the unseeing, dying boy. And instantly John Arthur began to chatter in his harsh voice, releasing a torrent of half-recognizable, half-remembered sounds. Mrs. Crabb followed her son towards his bedroom and Mrs. Sylvester carried her son behind them. John Arthur opened his door. As he went into the room there started from all corners of the darkness the whispers of his other patients. Mrs. Sylvester swallowed her apprehension and advanced towards the bed. She placed her motionless son on it. Still John Arthur poured out his dry, shouting sounds, echoed around the room by the rustling of the bat and the crow, the movement of the mole and the moth. Then Mrs. Crabb took Mrs. Sylvester firmly by the arm and led her back to the door, out of the room. They left John Arthur and the stricken boy alone, in the muttering darkness. John Arthur's cries stopped as the door closed. The two women waited outside the room, looking away from each other, along the corridor. Then, as though no time had passed at all, they were woken from their confusion, their doubts, by a barely perceptible click as the door opened and slowly swung wide. The light from the hallway spilled into the bedroom. John Arthur stood near his bed. His hair swept back from his brow, his eyes challenged the light, boldly staring towards the door. There was no one, no figure, no boy lying on the bed. 
Only the rumpled blankets showed the imprint of a body. Two things seemed to happen as one, two outbursts of sound and color simultaneously. Up from the bed there rose the metallic brightness of a bird, a jay. It beat across the room, blue, black, white and blue again. The jay struck the mirror with a loud crack, a dazzling duplicate of itself, dropping to the carpet and releasing a torrent of guttural shrieks. At the same time, with a mocking smile on his lips, John Arthur Crabbe began to speak in a clear, measured voice, welcoming his mother. The End Next Story The Frozen Man by John Trevina The country was the home of the cold genius of the North, a ridiculous ball of sun, no warmer than the moon, surrounded by coroni, the air glittering with crystals, every bush and bough coated with glazed frost, I had but to kick up the snow to see a shower of diamonds, and above the steel blue of the horizon hung a mirage, a deserted city of ice, a place of dreams and folklore. While I was staring at the spires and pinnacles shooting upward from silent streets of cloud, looking in vain for the snow-clad ghosts which should have been walking there, Chief Factor Armstrong came across, drew the corn cob from his mouth, and spoke, it's real good of you to go with Mac. I couldn't send him out by himself, as you might say, for Sinapis as a companion is no better than a dog. The boy isn't right either, swears he is, but I know better. I believe he's sick. He must go, for I've no one else. Old Mac is a good sort, I said. The best in the world, when you can keep him off religion and whiskey. He's fond of preaching, and the other thing. Here come the dogs, Armstrong went on heartily. Good luck to you, good weather, and lots of thanks. The assistant factor, MacDonald, and myself were about to start upon an expedition to the north. Game of every kind had been scarce that season, not a fox came near the fort, even wolves appeared to have deserted us, so we were going to explore the country for signs of the fur bearers, as we couldn't place much reliance upon the reports of wandering natives, although these same individuals had lately supplied Armstrong with information which made a journey of investigation necessary. According to them a party of Germans were passing through the country further north, trapping and shooting all the furs they could find, thereby infringing upon the rights of the governor and company of adventurers of England trading into Hudson's Bay. There's no truth in the yarn, Armstrong had said. Anyway, it's like this, if I make a search for these fellows, it will be found that the story is false. If I don't look for them, it will be true, and I shall hear something about neglect of duty. The long sleigh lay upon the glistening snow before the fort, packed with provisions and furs, while Sinapis with a heavy whip attempted to control the team of twenty-four dogs, the finest lot in the country, and the pride of the chief factor's heart. Well they might be, for the famous breed of sleigh dog, or husky, as the animal is generally named, is well nigh extinct today. These powerful brutes are more like bears than dogs. Their strength and staying powers are enormous, and their ferocity is on a par with their hardiness, which is indeed almost abnormal, as I have driven a team for a week on nothing but a little hard biscuit with a few scraps of deer pemmican and frozen fish strips once in the twenty-four hours. Yet they have snapped as fiercely and been to all appearance as lusty on the last few miles as at the start. Sinapis crawled into the back of the sleigh, the long lash curled out, the leaders yelped impatiently and bit each other. The next moment we were gliding along swiftly, enveloped in the smoke-like breath of the dogs, while old Armstrong waved a farewell from the fort. There is nothing half so exhilarating as a good scamper over the northern plains, wrapped up to the nose tip, lying full length along the sleigh, with a score of thoroughbred dogs in front. Away on all sides extended the snow-covered wastes, broken here and there by dark green fir bluffs, their tresses blue with ice. Not a man, not an animal, nor bird, nor insect could be seen for miles. But what of that? 
It was glorious to see the pale blue sky spotted with fragile cirri, to watch the frost dancing around, and to feel the sharp prick of the crystals against the exposed cheeks and nose, and to hear the comfortable swish of the sleigh as it slid along, and the quick panting of the dogs. That first day we traveled at a great rate, for the snow was solid and fairly even, although at times we would glance with a sudden shock off a hidden point of rock, or grate over a fallen tree trunk which the last sprinkle of snow had managed to cover. At evening we camped well inside a bluff, keeping up a huge fire, which was indeed needed, for our little spirit thermometer marked 46 below zero when I read it at 10 o'clock, and it would sink lower than that before morning. It was not until we had finished supper, and were bending to light our pipes at the fire, that MacDonald put a suspicion I had been harboring for the last hour into words. Say, he remarked, been watching the boy lately. Sinapis appeared restless and miserable. He never spoke, moved listlessly, and accomplished his tasks without any show of alacrity, working slowly and heavily, although that was no new thing with him. I answered MacDonald's question with another, what's wrong with him? He snorted impatiently. Sick, and dead sick, too. He was bad when we started, but wouldn't own to it, darn him. He'll be all right tomorrow. That's a silly thing to say. You know what a flimsy affair an Indian's constitution is. He's sick one day, dead the next. Doing his usual chores in the morning, taking his long rest at night. It's no use kicking back because you don't want to go on. What we want to do is to face the question. Let's put him in the sleigh, cover him up, and if he is all right in the morning the better for us. If he isn't, we'll have done all we can. You might have been worse off, Mac. If I hadn't come, if you weren't here I shouldn't think twice about it, he interrupted. I should hitch up the huskies first thing in the morning and start to work crossing those tracks we made today. Unluckily next morning there could be no question about the seriousness of the man's illness. What the disease was I couldn't tell, but his strength had gone, his head and body were racked with pains, and altogether he seemed in a bad way. However, we started off north as soon as we had partaken of some food, and made good progress all forenoon. Then evil fortune overtook us. We reached bad country, covered with rocks, and protected upon either side by a deep bank of pines. Here the snowbed was uneven. The sleigh, instead of gliding over the surface, broke through the crust, while the dogs sank up to their bellies, tugging ineffectually, and filling the air with their short angry barks. MacDonald and I looked at each other. Anger was visible all over his face, as he shouted sulkily to the dogs, who ceased from their labors willingly enough. Just what I told you, he grumbled. Directly Sinapis is struck down, this sort of job crops up. We're going to have a happy day, I tell ye. There was no help for it. We lashed on the snowshoes and walked ahead of the dogs, breaking a trail for them. It was hard work, and took all the breath we could spare, so there was little talk until we reached a good camping place and began to fix up for the night. Luckily the last few miles had been fairly easy, so we looked forward to good going on the morrow. It was worthy of note that during the whole of the day's journey we had never sighted a living thing. Sinapis was better, I thought. He was quieter and had stopped groaning. He lay still, and did not appear to notice either of us. We did what we could, little enough, then left him and tried to get to sleep ourselves. The night was milder, if twenty-five below may be called warm, but we were well sheltered by bluffs on every side. I was beginning to doze when MacDonald hit me in the ribs with the stem of his pipe, and I saw his quaint hairy face near mine. Man, he whispered, have ye seen the boy? Not for the last hour or two. What's wrong? I said. Have you seen his eyes? Get away, Mac, I muttered. I saw his eyes, he went on, 
I waved my hand up and down and they never winked. Man, he's crazy. Look here, Mac, I said, keep your horrors to yourself and let me get to sleep. Crazy, he repeated unpityingly. Knows he's going to die, and the fear old death has crazed his brain because he's a papist, and knows, I put out an arm, pushed him off, I dare say I cursed. MacDonald returned to his own side of the fire, quoted scripture at me, expressed a wish for a Bible that he might quote some more, and the last thing I heard as he settled down for sleep was a fervent whisper, Man, I'd give a year of my life for a wee bottle o' oh, Glenlivet. Our luck improved when we made a start in the morning. The bad country was soon left behind, and we scudded over a level bed at high speed, covering a large area of country that day, but we saw no game, only a few snowbirds with a wolf slinking away here and there. It was indeed a barren season. Nor did we discover any tracks of the band of trappers we had come out to look for, so we attributed the story to the imagination of the native brain, although it transpired later that the report was true. The men were never caught, but they quarreled when nearing the flats of Hudson's Bay, and the result was that two men, both Russians and not Germans, were picked up by the Indians fearfully hacked with knives about face and body. About four o'clock that afternoon we were gliding along briskly in the mysterious semi-darkness, when I found that my eyes troubled me. They smarted, and the lids twitched continually. Hanging my arm over the side of the sleigh, I caught up some snow to rub on my face. While raising my hand I happened to glance toward stolid old MacDonald, and to my amazement discovered a pink halo round his grizzled head. Turning my throbbing eyes towards the dogs, I noticed a soft pink radiance glowing round their bodies, while the steam-like breath pouring from their mouths floated away in roseate clouds, which to a poetical mind might have suggested an effect of sunrise. While I was wondering at the meaning of this phenomenon, MacDonald turned his head, and gazed at me solemnly with eyes that blinked and twitched like mine. Hello, angel, he exclaimed, without a vestige of humor in his voice. I stared at him, and he continued, I don't want to flatter ye, but you'd make a good Catholic idol just now. There's a red ring round your head any saint might envy. You've got one too, I said. Darn the lights, anyway, he muttered. Tis bad enough to see em when you're snug at home. When they strike ye out here, tis death for somebody. He's going. Keep off that, I muttered. If Sinapis isn't going off, one of us is. I guess it's better him than you or me. The long lash curled savagely over the brightly colored backs of the dogs, and we bounded along in silence. While I fixed my eyes upon a thick clump of furs which looked as though they were on fire. Presently a gruff exclamation at my shoulder made me start. Here they come, the devil's lights. I put my head back and glanced at the sky. Lurid tongues were creeping up from the magnetic north, and advancing with slow movements across the sky. They resembled flames of fire seen indistinctly through a cloud of smoke. On the opposite side flaming spindles shot upward in a clear sky, as though striking at invisible foes with their spear-like tips, and at the same time I heard a low moaning, like wind round a street corner on a wintry night. Otherwise there was silence, awful silence. Gradually the red hue became more pronounced, the air grew ghastly, figures seemed to creep by, the snow around might have marked the scene of a great carnage. MacDonald's face looked livid and awesome. I glanced once at the still countenance of Sinapis, but recoiled at the sight. Few words passed, and presently we reached the pine bluff we had long been heading for. A cloud of fire crested the summit. We began to prepare our camp, between the slender columns stretching in lengthy corridors on each side, faintly illumined, as if to receive us, with the lambent lights. We examined Sinapis, and one look passed between us. Amateur doctor that I was, a glance was enough to convince me the man was worse. 
His limbs were hot and covered with red spots. With his feeble arms he endeavored to toss off the furs, and if he could suffer from an excess of heat in that atmosphere, I knew he must be sick indeed. I looked at the thermometer, feeling that the temperature must be nearing an exceptional point. The spirits were skulking away at the bottom, and the index marked 61. I returned with the intelligence to my companion. 93 degrees of frost, Mac. He raised his shaggy head. Well, Angel, that's about the limit. A few more degrees and we shall be smothered. I knew it was something low. The air strikes like fire. A steady blow of wind now, and we should be shriveled up like dead leaves. We made four large fires at a slight distance from each other. For a couple of hours we toiled with axe and saw, felling wood to keep us in fuel for the night, but every other minute we had to pause and gasp for breath. Meantime the heavens were growing scarlet, the snow might have been soaked in blood, my companion's face grew more corpse-like. Load after load of resinous wood we carried to the camp, then settled down to nibble at what food we could manage to thaw. After an altogether insufficient meal, we sat down opposite each other to enjoy our only pleasure, a good pipeful of tobacco. The dogs gathered round, snapping at one another, lying so close to the fires that the air soon became filled with the odor of singeing fur, and we had to drive them back, lest they should place us in a quandary by committing suicide. Hard by lay Sinapis, wrapped up in the sleigh, never moving nor speaking. Nature has especially ordained that when the temperature reaches an extremely low point two things may not happen, a fire cannot burn dully, nor may the wind blow. Were it otherwise human existence in the far north would often be impossible. We smoked silently for an hour or more, only rising at intervals for fresh supplies of wood. The mysterious atmosphere bathed us in its red waves, the fiery cones and spindles above kept on darting and flashing, the shuddering shadows crept upon the trees. It was a remarkable night indeed. Presently MacDonald drew the last mouthful of smoke from his pipe. As he drew the little canvas bag out of his pocket, in winter he always carried his tobacco cut, he eyed me in a solemn fashion, and said, D.C., Angel. I'm not blind, I answered a bit testily, for I looked upon him as a superstitious old fool. Do ye hear, Angel, he continued in the same monotonous voice. Quit calling me Angel. I shouted. And talk of something else. It's nothing but the aurora. That's what they say. What makes the sounds? What makes the red lights jump around in the sky? What makes the shadows we see crawling around? Men whose heads are too big for their bodies talk about electricity and terrestrial magnetism, and clever enough they think themselves I have no doubt. But get M together, drive M in a bunch, and ask M straight what is electricity and what is terrestrial magnetism. You'll see them sit down and suck their thumbs. There are wiser men than us, Mac. There's a clever and common sense way of looking at things, he said stubbornly. One man wants to find the height of a wall. He takes a sheet of paper and a lot of fiddling tools, draws pictures, and decorates them with half the letters in the alphabet. At last he works out a sort of answer, mostly wrong. Another man slips to the top of the wall, drops a plumb line down, makes a knot in the line, and measures it. One's the clever way of finding the height of that wall and the other is the natural way. Give me the last. What's your idea, then, about the red lights? The devil fixes M up to scare us lonely fellows, and to warn us there's trouble coming. Why do we only see them out here? Why only in the extreme cold? Don't you try and corner the devil. He uses different methods to scare folk in other places. The red lights do show further south, and harm always comes with them. Sinapis will die. Because the aurora happens to be red once in a way, 
it's no reason why a man should die. Two years ago there was just such another night, the sky on fire and the snow bloody, went on MacDonald, in his unhappiest voice. Factor Robinson went out on the ice of the bay to look for his little dog, which had strayed from the fort. We picked him up next morning, smashed by a bear, so that his own mother wouldn't have known him. I helped to carry him back, took the shoulders, I did, and his head was like a rotten apple someone had set their foot on. Kept touching my legs, too. Man, I had to shut my eyes. I tried to laugh his words away, but only a dry sound came from my throat. No man could have been light-hearted amid such weird surroundings. This night, further south, no electric instruments will obey the hand of any man, my cheerful comrade rambled on. Telephones, telegraphs, all the rest of M, won't work, or will perform on their own account. I, on nights of this sort messages come along the wires, and the operators are called up by hands which have no flesh on M. Free electricity has powers of which we know little, I said. There ye are again. You're welcome to your notion and all you can make of it. Here's a little story, and if it isn't true, may my tongue be frostbitten. In a small town, a year or two agone, the red lights came along, and all the telegraph stations were closed. Late at night one of the operators went into the office for something, and while there the signal sounded. He stepped up and prepared to take down the message. The needle ticked away, only one word was transmitted, only one word, angel. They say he fainted right off. What was it? Death. Just that one word. Three months later it came for him. You've got queer notions, Mac. Maybe, angel. There are queer around us. I remember a fellow telling me once how, when the lights were bad, he switched on his telephone and listened. He wasn't a chap of powerful imagination, but he fairly made me shiver when he described how he heard the things twisting and turning round the wire outside, whispering and chattering, and groaning, quit it, Mac, I interrupted. If you haven't got anything better to talk about, let's sit quiet. He bent to tuck the buffalo robe beneath his knees. That moment I heard a sound, a movement. We looked up together, and saw Sinapis leap out of the sleigh and dash across the snow with the wild motions of a maniac, this man whom we supposed was unconscious and too weak to lift his head, here he was running like an athlete, a man hunted by death, and looking for a place to hide himself. He had been a trapper of beasts, a hunter, all his life, and now he was running with the strength lent him by madness, running from the grisly trapper who sought his life. Man, groaned MacDonald. I wish it weren't so lonesome. You're scared, Mac. I said hoarsely. I, he said. I've got it down my back. Same with you, he shouted. If it weren't for the red lights, your face would be as white as pudding. You ha, your eyes shut. If I could shut them, I would, was my answer. He'll never get out, oh, sight. He'll run and run all night, and will sit and watch. Man, I'd like a good black British night. Sinapis ran on, and as I gazed, unable to remove my eyes, his direction changed, and his motion became parallel with us, he seemed to be coming back, but it was not so, he passed, giving us a wide berth, and sped on, old MacDonald's head following his course, sheep-like. We perceived he was running in a circle of which we formed the center, run out and catch hold of him. I'll see him running to the end of my days, MacDonald whispered. I shuddered, but did not move. We were angels a while ago, church window paintings why, holy colors round our heads. Now we're devils. Who was that fellow who went to hell and saw the papists burn? Don't know, I muttered, never having heard of Dante in those days, and I was also angry, being myself a Catholic, as was Sinapis, 
and I did not like MacDonald's sneers at my religion. Bunyan or Gulliver, some such name, he rambled on. If ever I go back to Tobermory, I'll tell em I've been there, too. Again the Indian approached us, on another and smaller circle, and again he passed, but his speed was decreasing. We thought his strength was failing, but it was not that altogether. He went on describing circles, each drawing him nearer to us, and presently he fell on the snow and began to crawl. Played out, muttered MacDonald. Come on, Mac, I said, when I saw the poor wretch beginning to describe another circle on his hands and knees. By the wee. My breath ain't easy. A few more minutes passed, then I shook off the cold and the terror of the ghastly lights, crossed to MacDonald's side, and heaved him up. He came to his feet with as many groans as a dying man, together we crossed the snow and secured the Indian, but we let him go again and gasped. Before leaving the sleigh, some mood of madness had provoked him to tear off his socks and moccasins, and he had been running over that red snow, I do not know how long, with bare feet. He made no resistance. We carried him to the sleigh and wrapped him up, averting our eyes from those wax-like feet, then returned to our sleeping bags by the fire, glancing across at each other, afraid to speak for some time, but I heard a lot of gulping going on, and at last a queer hoarse voice, Man, you're a Christian, and I used to be. Shall we put a bullet through his head? What's the sin, when tis a kindness? Quit it, Mac, I said, and he put his head down and took to his pipe again. We could do nothing for Sinapis, only sit there and doze and wait for him to die. My eyes closed after a time, and I felt myself nodding, almost overbalancing. Suddenly I became wide awake, with a wild shudder, for I imagined something was leaning over, reaching out great hands to strangle me. I saw the red lights, and my excited imagination made me believe I saw also luminous faces revolving in one of those hideous circles, gradually advancing towards me with hollow eyes and bleeding jaws. I thought of Indian legends which I had laughed at when the sun was shining and nature had been normal, and then I heard a low, dull, scraping sound which woke me up. MacDonald had heard it too, but was not frightened. He wagged his head and grinned across the fire. He was nearer the sleigh than I was, and I supposed he could see what was going on. When a man's dying he gets a child again, he muttered. The boy's having a game. He's sawing a bit of wood. Neither of us wondered what was taking place in that wild, unhappy mind, struggling against its destiny of death, what agony was there, what love of life and home. He was only an Indian, we looked upon him rather as a dog, and were sorry he was about to die, chiefly because it would inconvenience us. I was fond of sawing a bit of wood when I was a youngster, MacDonald murmured lazily. Specially if, twas the Sabbath. I'd get father's hand saw and scrape for an hour at some log, and call myself a mighty fine carpenter when I saw what a pile of sawdust I was making. Eh, man, it was good to be a kitty. He went on murmuring a little, and as I watched his lips something appeared to cross my eyesight and strike MacDonald on the head. It was not my fancy, for he shouted, the boy's thrown a chunk of wood at me. Then he yelled, it's a moccasin, and the next instant started up and lurched towards me blubbering. Man, he panted. Take it away. It moves. Eh, man, it's a dead lump. He threw it away like an old boot. Take it away, my stomach's gone. Eh, man, man. I saw the thing lying in the light of the fire with the toes pointing towards it. Sinapis could have felt nothing while he sawed, because all feeling had been frozen out, and yet it was horrible, there. I could not move with MacDonald hanging to me, I dreaded the idea of touching the thing, but two of the dogs made for it, sniffing, one quicker than the other carried it away, and, we saw it no more. MacDonald was like an hysterical girl. I made him lie down, covered him over, 
then went to the side of the sleigh, looking down upon the sick man, but not at his feet. He had fallen back, the mad strength had given out at last, he was breathing with difficulty, and still struggling, not only against madness and disease, but, as I could not help thinking, for I was more than a little upset, he was still striving to avoid the clutches of some invisible power, other than death, which hovered above his resting place. I sat down again, while MacDonald's groans died gradually away. I never slept. I nodded dreamily, all the time conscious of my companion's terrified eyes peering at me over the bowl of his pipe, through a continually rising cloud of smoke. Nothing could have frightened MacDonald from his pipe. He was a hard smoker, and used to say the only thing he had against sleep was that it deprived a man of his tobacco. I remained conscious of what was taking place around, and I perceived that whiteness was gradually returning to the snow and the fire was dying out of the sky. Luminous clouds, with swords of light flashing round the edges, moved slowly up, streamers quivered in the north, lengthening or shortening as the whim seized them. Falling back and resting my head against a pile of wood, I watched the strange forms, which were never for a moment at rest, hurrying always from one side to another, until it occurred to me that the prevailing movement was that of descent. These cloud spirits in their diaphanous robes of light, were inclined to leave the sky vault, to drop down towards us, to wrap us in their fleecy raiment, and carry us away to that land beyond the ice mountains, towards which men are always struggling, which they never have reached. I had laughed, before that night, at the foolishness of the Indians. When these lights are bright, they will creep from their tents, uplift their arms towards the descending masses, cry aloud, then hurriedly re-seek the partial shelter of their homes. Why? Because at the sound of the human voice the descending motion ceases. The lights break up, scatter and flee away to all parts of the heavens, removing themselves until the atmosphere ceases to vibrate with the echo of the voice. Then they steal down once more, flock together in a ghostly band, and begin again to drop towards the brown tents. Should we not do this, says the native, should we refrain from shouting with our voices, the spirits would descend, draw us away, and bear us to the land of the unmelting snow, for spirits drink the blood of mortals. Wild thoughts such as these course through my brain as I lay in a half-somnolent state. The luminous clouds were descending with steady movements. They appeared larger, and a fire might now be perceived burning within the heart of each. Down, still down, nearer and closer, until my blinking eyes discovered long attenuated limbs, loosely robed, with hooked, blood-stained extremities working towards their prey. Still down, and the cloak fell aside. Hideous faces peered forth, malignant eyes revolving like red-hot wheels, huge mouths with gruesome fangs gnashing for a victim. But no other features, except ears, long and pointed, held erect for sounds of human life. I struggled to free myself, but an unseen power held me chained. It was the devil's hunt, and these were his hounds. They were in full cry and we were the quarry. But which was it to be? It must be the one who failed to send the cry ringing forth into the night. Again I struggled, still the hand crushed me to the icy ground. MacDonald was bending over me, a pitying smile upon his face, on his lips the words, So, you are the chosen. Well, I am sorry, but I warned you against the death lights. You see, they have proved too strong, after all. There my dream was broken by a cry. I started up with dry throat, my body shivering with cold and the horror of the vision. As I dragged myself up, those grim lights darted swiftly away, and the next second were hurrying across the heavens, whispering in triumph, as though they had succeeded in their quest and were not returning empty-handed. I heard MacDonald's voice, but when I turned, my fear came back. What is it, Mac? Did I scare you? You, he cried, in a high-pitched voice. 
How could ye scare any one, lying dead asleep? Didn't I cry out? You never made a sound. He did. He shouted one word. What? Masha, go away. A nice thing to say with his last breath. His last breath? Man, look at him, he cried fiercely. Don't lie there. Go and look at the boy. I rose, though my knees shook. I made my way to the side of the sleigh, through a ring of snoring dogs. I bent over the side, and looked upon the brown face which stared up surrounded by a frost-covered pile of furs. Sinapis was dead. Morning came at last, the sun glittered upon the snow plains, dispelling the unnatural colors of the night. As the day was only of a few hours' duration we had to make the most of it. When it was time for departure, we came to a disagreement concerning the disposal of the body. We had stripped away the furs, applying them to our own use, and the figure lay beneath the pines, stretched out straight and stiff, frozen by the inexorable cold into a mass as solid as a block of marble. I had touched the dark face with the tip of an unprotected finger, scraping away a line of ice crystals, and in doing so froze the skin with that contact against the inanimate stone, I could not call it flesh. MacDonald, superstitious to the end of his nails, though brave enough now that it was day, averred that he would not travel in such ghastly company. On the other side, I declared it would be an act of wickedness to leave the body behind, seeing that Sinapis had been a Christian, and therefore deserved a proper burial. There happened to be a priest near the fort, and as the body would keep forever in that temperature, I argued that it was our duty to take it back. But MacDonald waxed wrathful. Plant him in the snow right here, and have done with it. What's left of Sinapis is going back with us, if only for the sake of satisfying Armstrong. So it's no good you talking, I said firmly. At length, being Britishers, we compromised. The body was to follow us, lashed upon a little sleigh, which we improvised out of pine branches and attached to the back of our own. Even so MacDonald was uncomfortable, and continually glanced over his shoulder to satisfy himself that the body was, as he expressed it, keeping dead. During that short day we traveled swiftly over the dusty snow, approaching our journey's limit. Still we saw scarcely any game, although wolves and foxes grew more plentiful, nor could we discover any mark of moccasin, no trellis work pattern where the snowshoe had pressed, no parallel grooves where runners had passed. Onward we swept towards the endless ice fields, swifter as afternoon grew, for the bed was solid, and along our trail bounded the stone-like image of the frozen man. That night we encamped in the open. At least, there were banks of firs on all sides as wind breaks, but we made our fire in a space at the bottom of a slight dip, which we found to be natural and not a freak of the snow. The first thing was to isolate ourselves from our companion, so we unlashed the figure, dragged it over the ridge, and left it stiffly stretched upon its bier of pine branches in the valley beyond, out of sight, yet not more than seventy-five yards away. We had supper, commenced our tobacco and conversation, the latter of which did not continue long, since we had little of a pleasant nature to talk about, and were both tired. A more beautiful sight I have rarely witnessed than the calm splendor of that night. White light poured over the dark summits of the pines, making their silvery tresses flash like a woman's hair with diamonds in it. When the great moon appeared, with a stately movement, the snow plains looked as soft and warm as a bed of feathers, and, opposite, the shivering arch of the aurora was a thing of beauty, not, as on the former night, a thing of horror. Silver streamers darted from the arch, illumining the sky with narrow bands, and countless spindles, dwindling away to nothingness, moved slowly, lengthening and shortening, one springing from the side of another. I lay in a fine drowsy comfort, wrapped up to the eyes, in the sleigh. I heard the dog snarling. I could see MacDonald endeavoring to clear the stem of his pipe, 
which was blocked, and smiled lazily when I perceived his lips moving, as he silently cursed his best friend. I watched the frost crystals dancing joyously everywhere. I followed the course of sparks carried from the keenly burning fire, and regretfully considered that I might have to bestir myself in an hour or so to haul in more fuel. There was not a breath of wind. I watched the tops of the pines for ten minutes together, in the hope of seeing some motion, but I could not declare I ever saw one stir an inch. I might have been gazing upon a panorama. My brain was active, and passed rapidly from one subject to another. I wondered how many men in the course of the world's history had crossed the spot where we then rested. I tried to imagine the surroundings when this inhospitable land was a tropical country, infested by monsters now nothing more than skeletons, and tried to guess what the next change would be, when men had dug up all the vegetation of the coal period. My next idea was to guess at the nearest human beings. There would be Eskimo along the bay, perhaps two hundred miles east by north, but closer might probably be found a wandering band of swampy crees. Finally I spared a thought for the silent figure in the valley. I had trusted Sinapis, for he was somewhat of an exception to the rule that a Christian Indian is sure to be an unprincipled rogue. He was an excellent hunter, and more than once had led me along the fresh trail of the moose, he was a good servant, rarely shirking his duties unless liquor came in his way. Now he had finished his life in the remote north, very far from cities and learning, he had been dragged into the vortex of the unknown, perhaps at that moment he knew of more mysteries than the wisest of us have ever dared to guess at. It was not wonderful, in such a place, at such a time, that my last thoughts should turn toward sentiment, as I sank imperceptibly into slumber, but I am certain this insensibility was of short duration, and of the nature of a dog's sleep, for my senses were active, and alive to every sound or motion. So I became presently convinced that I had for some little time been listening to a scuffling noise, probably at no great distance, although in that abnormally clear atmosphere a sound would travel for miles. The moon was well up in the heavens, and looked down upon us coldly. An unearthly cry certainly rang in my ears, then a shadow fell upon the snow. I looked up and saw a tawny owl, with big horns and round eyes. He wheeled down, flapped his great wings, and glided away. I was half awake only, yet there surely were sounds in the valley adjoining. Bodies in motion, pattering of feet upon crisp snow, stealthy glidings and whisperings. I pulled myself upright to listen more intently. And, as I did so, an awful cry burst forth, rending the still night air like a trumpet blast, every syllable of the message beating with accompanying echo in my ears, Sifete. Masha. The silence that followed was worse than the voice. I shook like a man with ague, my teeth went chattering together, my heart thumped furiously. I heard a gasp, as though someone was choking. Then I managed to look round at MacDonald. His face was all manner of colors, and his hands were beating together in a fashion that might have been ludicrous at any other time. I could no longer doubt that those words had been spoken, or rather shouted, in appeal to us and who could have given them utterance except the grim figure of the frozen man. It was no use trembling there, waiting for the cry to be repeated, but it is a curious fact that when a man is really frightened he imagines himself safer while he remains quiescent. The act of motion suggests a challenging of unseen powers. However, I spoke, though there was a tremor in my voice which had a savor of cowardice. You heard, Mac. It was a foolish remark, but it opened a way between us. He came shambling towards me, on hands and knees, grabbing hold of my arm when he reached the side of the sleigh. I told ye t'would be bad traveling white that. I knew the boy wouldn't rest. He'll be running now, running round and round. What's the matter with it? How can a body frozen through and through scream out? Twas his voice, but scared and crazy. 
Masha was his last word. He said it because he was afraid to die. His body is in danger. I tumbled out of the sleigh. Come, Mac, we must see what he wants. He was calling to us. He was telling them to leave his body alone. Telling who? I don't know. Perhaps he's not dead. Perhaps the frost is keeping his, what do you papists call it? His soul from departing. I, something that way. We must go and look. Let's keep hold of your arm. The fear isn't so bad when you have it up why, another. The Lord only knows what devilry the boy may be up to. We ascended the incline with slow steps, both of us dreading to look down from the top of the ridge. Twas his own voice. Just the voice he used when he was scared, muttered MacDonald, nearly pulling me down with his weight. We neared the summit, a few more steps and the ridge would have been surmounted, when, without a note of warning, the cry darted out into the night, and we both sank upon our knees to the ground, shivering, awestruck, Sifete. Masha! Come away, wailed MacDonald, catching at my legs as I tottered up, and bringing me down again. There are things we can't look at. Come back and hitch up the dogs, and let's get away. He's running, I know he's running. I fought with my breath, which was like a flame of fire. We can stand it now, Mac. We're ready for it. Another two steps and we shall see. I pulled him up, but he didn't hang to my arm. He clapped both hands to his ears. In this fashion we crossed the ridge, but when I looked down on the valley my courage returned, while the same word fell from the lips of us both, wolves. A score or so round the motionless figure of the frozen man, hungrily struggling to tear that marble flesh. One part of the mystery was explained. Come away down, Mac, I cried. There's nothing to fear. My companion recovered wonderfully when he perceived that the dead man was not running. He raised his great voice, bellowed lustily, and we floundered into the valley, while the animals sullenly dispersed. Sinapis lay just as we had left him, upon his back, the face, covered with glittering frost, gazing up at the white moon, the scanty garments torn into shreds by the fangs of the wolves. There was nothing to tell us how that cry had been uttered. We could only wonder, as so many had done before us, trying in vain to tear away the veil which hangs between us and the mystery of death. Each of us took an end of rope, and we retraced our steps to the camp fire dragging the beer and left it not far behind us in a position of safety away from the heat. This task accomplished, we settled in the sleigh, tucked ourselves up, and presently MacDonald said, we'll make for home first thing, and we won't take him with us. I had weakened in my resolution. Perhaps we'd best leave him. We'll bury him as decently as we can. Aye, he said. Then there was silence again. I'm not religious, though I quote scripture, MacDonald confessed. Tis a habit merely. I'd like to understand it. Twould help a man. It's beyond us, Mac. Folks used to say the soul of a dead man couldn't rest unless the body was properly buried. If the wolves had torn Sinapis to pieces, the funeral would never have taken place. They would say that the spirit, which must have been looking after the body, used the power of human speech for the purpose of appealing to us. He never did, not us. He was calling out to anyone. Well, it came to the same thing. It told us the body required help, and we were the only ones who could give it. I guess you're right, he said. Anyway, tis no use my disagreeing, for I've not your education. This from MacDonald was a great concession. There's nothing to keep us out longer, I observed. We'll start back in the morning, first thing. Armstrong can do all the talking he likes. The furs have left this district, and as for those trappers, 
they never did have any existence outside of a lie, Sifete. Masha. We sprang up with a yell, for this shock was worse than the first. The voice was so close, the tones were so distinct and agonized. During that first moment I felt sure the body must have moved, and, when I turned, gave a gasp of relief at not seeing the awful face of the frozen man at my shoulder. As for MacDonald, I was afraid he had gone off his head, for he danced in front of me, gesticulating wildly. Oh Lord! Oh Lord! It cut all round me like a whip. The scuffling noise came again, but this time accompanied by angry barks and snarls. Again we found a partial explanation. Now it was the dogs who had made an attack upon the frozen body. As I reached out my hand for the whip, I saw one of the leaders, a tremendous brute, standing upon the dead man's chest, licking the icy face with his great tongue. The next moment he sprang back with a howl as the thong struck him across the head. A few more strokes, and the rest of the ravenous pack were driven off. I pulled the frozen man to the side of the sleigh and tumbled him in, unassisted by MacDonald, who refused to approach the mysterious remains. Then I sat down beside it and watched until morning. Better a loss of sleep than any repetition of that horrible cry. And in the raw red light of the dawn we buried him. Hitching up the dogs, we drove to a thick bluff, south of our encampment. Here we found a snow hill, crested by a lofty dome like a miniature cathedral, with dark rounded columns of pine stretching away in a kind of religious darkness. With our axes we cut a deep hole, laid the frozen man in his resting place, a strange dark figure in the midst of perfect whiteness, then piled the snow, like inodorous flowers, upon the unquiet body. Before leaving, I felt it my duty to commend the dead Indian to the safekeeping of Providence as best I could, although I was well aware MacDonald was eyeing me askant and often grunting. When I concluded he muttered, Man, I can beat that, flopped down upon the snow, and began to pour forth a long recitation, which, as far as I could make out, was nothing but a rebuke to me and others of my creed, until I became very cold and weary. At length he rose, and said to me proudly, never repeated myself. I could have gone on for half an hour. We turned from that quiet pine bluff and the dome of snow which protected the remains of Sinapis. Again we glided over the plains to the music of the sleigh bells, but now we were on the homeward trail, traveling at full speed over the dazzling plain, with a cold sun above and loneliness on every side. Home. The word had a pleasant sound after what we had undergone. Even though it was nothing better than a solitary log-built fort in the center of a frozen land. 